Hello, I'm Dora Song, Performing Arts Librarian at Greenwich Library, and welcome to Date with an Author and Authors Live. We are thrilled to help celebrate Women's History Month with such an incredible cast of characters featured in Lauren Willig's latest historical fiction novel, Band of Sisters, published by William Morrow. Lauren Willig is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of The Summer Country, the Rita Award-winning Pink Carnation series, and three novels co-written with Beatrice Williams and Karen White. A native New Yorker, Lauren is a graduate of Yale University and has a graduate degree in history from Harvard and a JD from Harvard Law School. Date with an author and Authors Live is made possible through the support of the Greenwich Library Board of Trustees and contributions by our generous donors. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so delighted to be here to celebrate Women's History Month and the amazing women of Band of Sisters with you. Well, we're equally excited. Um, your outstanding novel, I am going to show it again for our viewers <laughs> out there because I love the cover so much. I love the artwork and I love the typeface. Your outstanding novel is based on real people and events describing the effort of the Smith College Relief Unit, a, a selective group of 18 Smith College volunteers who travel to war ravaged uh, France to help the civilians of uh, France assist them. Um, the concept originated after you read the 1920 memoir, Ladies of Grey Court. I'm saying that correctly. I may not have the French yeah, uh, pronunciation correct. Yeah, uh, the Smith College Relief Unit in the Psalm written by Ruth Gaines. Can you tell us more about the Smith College Re Relief Unit and how this small little memoir inspired you? Absolutely. Well, at the time, so I stumbled upon the Smith College Relief Unit by accident. I had had no idea that there was female humanitarian work going on in the Somme. You know, the story that we know about World War One, it's very much it's trenches, it's dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, it's your know, warring European monarchs. You don't really think about these long skirted women out there in the mud bringing milk to French villagers, but that that was apparently going on. So I was researching World War I, World War II, and the 1960s in France for a book I was co-writing with two good friends, Beatrice Williams and Karen White. And for the World War I portion of this book, we needed to know about Christmas customs in Picardy during World War I. Would Christmas have been celebrated as usual, even under the German occupation? So while I was digging around for details, up popped this memoir you mentioned, The Ladies of Grey Court by Ruth Gaines, about a group of smithies in the Somme throwing Christmas parties for villagers. And my immediate reaction was, this can't possibly be real. This has to be fiction. I've stumbled on someone's novel, but it wasn't a novel. It was an actual memoir written right after the fact by a member of the Smith College Relief Unit. Um, and the story I found was that, so we all know that France was occupied during World War II, but what many people don't know is that France was also occupied, or at least in part, by the Germans during World War I. Um, and in March of 1917, the French and the Brits finally managed to push the Germans back a little. Not much, but a bit. Um, but before the Germans marched out, they did their best to create as much destruction as they could. They hustled a group of villagers to one village, and then they went back to the deserted villages, and they destroyed any means of shelter and sustenance. They broke plows, they poisoned wells, they destroyed homes, you name it, they destroyed it. And then they took these villagers and they said, okay, you can go home now. Um, and the villagers at this point were only the very young, the very old and the infirm because all the able-bodied men and women were had long since been set off, sent off to work camps in Germany. One of the heartbreaking things I read about was that they rounded up teenage girls before they retreated and they sent these teenage girls off to work camps in Germany. Their families had no idea what would become of them or where they were if they were still alive. But anyway, so the, these poor villagers were sent back to their homes in the hopes that they would starve and die and be a burden to the French war effort. But what the Germans hadn't reckoned with was one Smith College alumna named Harriet Boyd Hawes who heard about this humanitarian crisis and decided that what was needed to deal with the situation were clearly American college women. And she went back to the States and delivered a rousing speech at the Smith College Club in Boston, 
urging her comrades to arms and they answered. Some donated money, others aided in the organizational work and 18 women signed up as members of the brand new Smith College Relief Unit. And their mission was reconstruction work. It was to go over and rebuild the lives of these villagers who had been crushed between two armies. Um, they were going to rebuild the agricultural base by bringing them livestock and seeds. They were going to bring basic social work to you know, help children learn to play again, provide um, school class, uh, schooling and get their own schools, these French schools up and running again by providing buildings, books, helping the teachers, finding teachers. Um, and so basically every aspect of life was going to need to be rebuilt from scratch and these smithies were going to go over and do it. Fascinating. I was really taken by the character's bravery and courage. Um, and so much of your plot was based on real life situations. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about what you found about these characters? Sure. I mean, usually when usually when I'm writing my books, I'm desperately searching for sources and triangulating around absences. In this case, the women of the Smith College Relief Unit were prolific letter writers. They wrote the most wonderful letters home. They were alternately earnest and snarky. They made light in the most amusing ways of their own mishaps and discomforts. And let me tell you, there were a lot of mishaps and discomforts. Um, but they took their work and the villagers they were serving very seriously. Um, so it, these letters provide wonderful contrast and wonderful details. Um, and it's very rare that you have something where you have 15 people all describing the same event at the same time. So you get to look at this event through multiple eyes at once. Um, so in this case, everything you read in the book are really are things that actually happened to the Smith College Relief Unit. Um, from their getting onto the boat, they boarded the SS Rochambeau in New York on August 3rd of 1917, and they were almost immediately handed metal dog tags with their names on them in case the ship was torpedoed and their bodies needed to be identified. Um, so there are all of these details that actually happened. You know, another one of my favorite stories is they get to Paris and they find that there's not enough room in the inn. Their director had only booked them room enough for nine and there were far more of them and the unit was gonna be split up before they began, but they managed to, uh, to wrangle an attic to use as a dormitory and sort of save the situation. And so there are constantly all of these stories that popped up that I was able to simply put my fictional characters into the places of these real women. And of course, I have to confess, there are times in which my some of my characters are more fictional than others. Um, my two main characters, my heroines, Kate and Emmy, are entirely of my own weaving. On the other hand, a lot of the side characters, including the director of the unit, are very closely based on the real people as they seem to me through their letters. But you know, I felt very strongly about using fictional alter egos rather than the real people. Um, among other things, because I was reading all of these very private letters, and some of them were intensely personal. Um, at the time, their families had sent some of these letters into the Smith Alumni Quarterly, um, which then excerpted the letters. You know, basically took the good bits, cut out anything controversial or depressing, and posted them. And then you'd start to see in the private letters um, complaints saying, you know, please stop sending my letters to the alumni mag. These were private. I meant to share these with you, not the world. And I took that, I meant to share these with you, not the world, very, you know, very much to heart. I felt like I could not, I could use them for information. I could use them to create fictional characters, but I couldn't reveal the real people's thoughts to the world under their own names. That would be unfair to them. That's amazing how you had so much respect for your characters and, you know, the original the original real life women who lived through this. Um, I was really taken, um, I kept, I was taken by the characters and actually the real life women, their bravery, their, cur uh, their courage. And what struck me so much is that um, at this point in American history, women didn't even have the right to vote. It was 1917, 1918, and the women didn't get the right to vote you know, across the nation until 1920. So, what led these women to have such agency over their own lives? It just was remarkable. What do you think? Well, I think we're at a time of great flux in American history vis-a-vis -vis women, that these women are all independent, um, grown-up women. They, they run the gamut from class of 
1888 to class of the youngest was class of 1914. So these are women ranging in age from their mid twenties to roughly around 50. These are grown ups, and many of them had a background in um, settlement house work. Settle the settlement house movement was one in which upper middle class women would go into urban slums and provide hygiene classes and basic social service work. So a number of the real Smithies who went over had a background in social service um, where they had taught kindergarten to underprivileged children or various other similar things. So these were women who were used to going into tough situations, although nothing as tough as what they found there. So I think we have this idea that women's lives were much more constrained than they actually were. Um, these were all college women at a time when that really meant something. Because, you know, there was still, you had to, it wasn't just that if you were an upper middle class woman, you went to college as a matter of course, you had to actively choose to go. It was a statement. Um, I read, you know, in, when I was researching this book, I read a bunch of, I read up on Smith in the early 20th century, including a bunch of novels by Smithies of the era about their time at Smith. And one of the things that struck me struck me was characters in these novels convincing other characters that it was okay to go to Smith. It wouldn't ruin them socially. Um, they could still get married. And so it was at, at the time, it was very much, you know, by you were marking yourself by going to a women's college as a new woman, as a determined proto-career woman. So that's who these women were. Um, they really even though they didn't have the vote, they had all been out there doing things. In fact, there were two female doctors in the group, um, one of whom Alice Well Talent, class of 96, was sort of a really groundbreaking woman. Their director was a groundbreaking archeologist, Harriet Boyd Hawes, class of 92, who had as a young Smith grad herself gone off to Greece and fought for the right to be allowed to excavate at a time when women weren't allowed to excavate. And she did groundbreaking work on the island of Crete and really made her name, but also paved the path for other women archeologists going forward. So this group was composed of incredibly determined groundbreaking women who weren't going to take no for an answer from anyone from sort of the top of the unit all the way on down to the individual members. Although your point about suffrage, actually one of my favorite letters I discovered when I was reading through their private letters was one home from a woman who said, hooray for suffrage. They had just gotten the word in the Psalm that the vote had passed for women in New York. And she said the New Yorkers and the one Californian in the group were relentlessly crowing over the women from less fortunate states. That must have been an amazing place to be at that point. Um, I, I just found that so remarkable. Thanks for explaining that. I'm um, going to go on at such length about that. I was actually, sure. you know, I think we have such, um, uh, we have such preformed ideas about the role of women in earlier eras and what their lives were like. And the thing is, it's not, it's never a direct, you know, telos. It's always a cycle that at various points, women have more freedom and do more, and then it constricts again. And I think this period was one in which women actually were out there doing things. There was the idea of the new woman, all capital letters. And we forget that because our, our lens is colored by later periods when things shrunk again for women. Um, I was amazed by the freedoms they described in their letters, in their lives in the Psalm. They had all of these gentlemen callers who would just hang out in their barracks with them. And, you know, it sort of, it struck me that, you know, at the back of my head, I expected things to be more constrained and constricted, and it wasn't. They were also, they were very, they were pragmatic women of the world in many ways. They, they were incredible and they were accomplished and determined and they had such self-confidence. Um, as explained in your book. Um, and I want to pick up on something I saw in one of your uh, interviews um, on your Instagram account, surprisingly. Uh, you mentioned that these women were remarkable and outstanding, but it was actually pretty commonplace at this point in time of history for women to be out there doing such incredible uh, groundbreaking things. Um, can you discuss that a little bit more? Well, as much as I would love to claim that these smithies who I have taken to my heart were absolutely unique, they were in fact only one of several female relief units in the Psalm. I think what makes them a little different is they were basically crowdfunded. They were funded by alumni, they were an all volunteer organization, and they were living there with their villagers in the mud, really roughing it. Um, but 
they had, but right not not very far from them, for example, was Anne Morgan, J.P. Morgan's daughter, who had funded her own relief, humanitarian relief mission. Um, Helen Clay Frick came over not long thereafter, you know, Frick's daughter doing, also doing relief work in the Somme. And so there were a lot of these female-led missions all engaged in reconstruction work. And actually the Smith unit inspired a bunch of other women's college relief units, the Vassar College Relief Unit and the Wellesley College Relief Unit. Once the Smith unit had proved a success, they followed shortly thereafter. Um, but this is a side of the war we really never hear about. I mean, just the same way as I don't think, you know, so, so much of these women's experience was based on their background in settlement housework. And I think that's another thing we generally don't hear about. We know about the founding of the Junior League and you know how that started in the slums of New York and all that. But the fact that that was part of a broader movement and so many um, elite women had these backgrounds in social work is something that seems to have gone written out of the history. Thanks, that, that's a really important note of uh, trying to uh, bring back, writing women back into, into the a narrative of history, bringing back their narrative and their story. And, and that was really important. That's, I really love that about the book. Um, you mentioned, oh, sorry. Uh, I, you, I, say, I think often, you know, this was something we used to talk about a lot back when I was back in grad school, is that often legal constraints don't necessarily mesh with on the ground realities. That you know, someone can be, for example, not a person under the law and still be living a very full and vibrant life. And so I think we often confuse the legal strictures that surrounded women, the fact that, for example, they couldn't vote and assume it means more broader limitations in their lives and what they were able to do. Um, a friend of mine wrote her dissertation on medieval female merchants. Technically women were not allowed to own property, but you had these uh, actually in a really astounding number of women in medieval England who were running their own businesses. So these things often coexist. And I think we tend to project from the fact that women couldn't vote or you know, women under the law that up to a certain point, their property was their husband's. And we assume that this, this, this means that their lives were narrow in many ways in which their lives were not. Sorry, that's a hobby horse of mine. No, that's wonderful. And that's so fascinating to hear women throughout history did have agency of their own of their own existence. And it's kind of affirming and um, really reassuring at the same time. Um, I wanna talk about uh, the Smith unit had 18 women. I think you distilled the actual characters to 15, am I correct? Yes, I cheated because you know it's very hard to create an ensemble cast where the individual characters are memorable and people don't feel overwhelmed by names. And I knew there was no way I was going to be able to keep track of 18 distinct characters. And if I couldn't, how would anyone else? So, but I also wanted to be true to the historical background. So in the book, I really, I cheated. I mentioned there being 18 members, but then if you actually go and count the named ones, you'll notice that I am short. Well, 15 certainly is a, is a considerable amount. I was wondering if you could talk about your writing process a bit and tell us how you kept track of each character, of their idiosyncrasies, of their plot lines, and how did that structure your story with so many different, uh, so many different patterns and, and characters? Well, in this case, as in so much with this book, I really am deeply indebted to the letters that the real women wrote home because so many of them, their characters came across to me so clearly in those letters and there were such distinct characters and such wonderful details in there that sort of revealed their characters that it really helped me create these distinct individuals and find places for them within the narrative. I mean, my two main characters, Kate, the scholarship girl from Brooklyn, who's basically pure a tree grows in Brooklyn, and Emmy, who's on the other end of the social spectrum, her mother is a scion of the Knickerbocker and Mayflower and all that, with these gilded age suffragettes who comes from a powerful family and fights for women's rights. Um, so they're on opposite ends of it. And the two of them I created from scratch and really had to work at thinking out who they were. But I feel like so many of these other characters were just handed to me on a platter because you know you, you read these letters and you think, oh my goodness, this is who this person is with all these little quirks and idiosyncrasies. And of course, you know, when I created my fictional characters, I, I took elements from the real people. I didn't try to recreate them wholesale, but it certainly helped. Yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned about the letters. I absolutely love um, when 
authors incorporate letters and I love the use of each letter opening up a chapter. It was really almost like getting, um, getting more information on the character, but almost like living in their skin. It was so beautifully done and it was so immersive to the reader. I just, I just loved it. And I wanted to ask you if that helped you stru structure your novel in that respect. So, um, so well, thank it, you for explaining that. Well, I, I didn't feel like it necessarily helped me with the structure, but I wanted to give a sense to the reader of what it was like to be able to read this wonderful, rich material that the members of the Smith College Relief Unit had left behind, the experience of getting to see their time in France through so many different eyes. Because you know, I've always ascribed heavily to the idea that everyone is the heroine of her own story. And so that while from the eyes of our my two heroines, various characters might seem nicer than others, everyone feels that she is justified in her own head. And so I wanted to give a little window on this, how different people were reacting to the same situations, because and a sense of the almost kaleidoscopic experience of reading all these letters and getting to see all of these different opinions and takes on the same event. Um, so I, and it's also my thank you to the real Smith women and an acknowledgement that their source material was what made this book happen. Yeah, I love that. I have to say, I really love that. It was so, it was, I felt like I was just transported to that time with the letters and then uh, leading into the chapter it was really so beautifully done. Thank you. Um, your book, the book is so much about friendship. It's about sisterhood. Um, it's about the relationships among these women who are all different, but they all have these similar goals. Um, if you could talk a little bit about the class and social structure at the time, and how did it affect the characters and their relationships with each other? Well, of course. Um, you know, this was certainly, it was a very different time in American history, and one of the big class divisions was between um, Protestants and Catholics, that this was a time when there was still very strong anti-Catholic sentiment in America. And to be Catholic was to be associated with, you know, the poor groups of immigrants who were coming in in waves in the late 19th century, the Irish, um, Germans, Czechs, and so on, that the America's elite regarded with sort of disdain and distrust. Um, you know, we forget now in our, our own current upheavals that there was a time when there was really strong anti-Irish sentiment. And so one of my two heroines is a scholarship girl at Smith. She is, as she describes it to herself in her own head, she feels that to the other girls, she's just another Bridget, Irish, Catholic, and poor. And this was inspired again by the source material because when I was reading that original memoir, I was very struck by the tone when referring to the one Catholic member of the unit. Um, in that case, in the real life group, the one Catholic member of the unit was the unit's junior doctor. And I switched things around a bit. I did not make my heroine the junior doctor. I made someone else the junior doctor. But anyway, in real life, the one junior doctor was a woman named um, Maud Kelly, who was the only Catholic in the group. And the tone changed when talking about her. And then when I got into the private letters, not in all, but in some of the women's letters home, there were some very strongly worded anti-Catholic sentiments, including a comment about how well Catholics aren't really Christians. And I was it, and I, as I was researching Smith, one of the things I found was that for the class of 1911, the class my heroines would have attended, there would have been, for example, I think I'm trying to remember the numbers now, but something like 40 Baptists of all you know groups that you don't really think of as having a large representation, um, and uh, five Catholic girls and one Jewish girl in the entire Smith class. So, I mean, it would have, I, so I started thinking, what would it be like to be that outlier? How would that make you feel to know that you had gotten there on your brains, but that to everyone else, you were still tarred by your religion and by your origins? Because my heroine is the daughter of um, an Irish American mother and a Czech immigrant father. So she is really, you know, the lowest of the low in the eyes of much of America's elite at the time. But of course, when she is in France with the Smith unit in the eyes of everyone there, the French villagers they're helping, she's another Smithy. And so it's this odd dual life that she's living um, on the other end of the spectrum. So I, I chose the two ends of the social spectrum for my two heroines. Her best friend and college roommate has it, the opposite problem. Her lineage is impeccable. She can trace herself back to the original Dutch inhabitants of New York, you know, the people who sneer at the Mayflower as the Johnny come lately. 
Um, but she didn't, she knew she didn't get into Smith on smarts. That, you know, she is very socially comfortable, but she is intellectually insecure and feels that compared to her best friend, Kate, you know, the scholarship girl, that she's kind of a mess and she would never have graduated from Smith without Kate. So each of the women has something the other lacks. And of course, at the time, to be from the upper, upper class was also an issue at Smith because that was, that was a group that was not sending their girls to college at the time. You were really meant to go and do your debutante season and get married. It was the intermediate group, the upper middle class lawyers' daughters who went to Smith mostly. And so my two are sort of those two ends of the spectrum and each of them makes the other feel insecure in some way or another. Because you know, we always do tend to um, see others through the lenses of our own insecurities. I've always been fascinated by how friendships are so often built on your, your friend has something that you perceive as lacking in yourself. So you're both fulfilling something by having that friend, but it also makes you insecure and you assume they think less of you. Well, in fact, they probably see something in you that they themselves don't have. So that's the dynamic between my two friends and it rests very heavily on these social dynamics, social and class dynamics of the time. And they have to, I think part of it is that in going to France and working with these war-torn villagers and finding themselves in situations that strip away all the superficials, they can finally start to see each other as the real people they are, as opposed to their places in the social pecking order. Yeah, that was fascinating. I love the juxtaposition between Kate and uh, her best friend, Emmy. And they were just sort of projecting these feelings on each other, uh, for on each other, for each other. And you wanted to just grab both of them and say, "Snap out of it!" <laughs> but I just, I, I love the, you know, their inner dialogue, and it, it formed the choices that they made. It was, it just led to such, you know, tension and drama. Um, but it was so beautifully done. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna sort of switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit because I'm a librarian and I have to, and I'm one of those rare people, those rare special breeds of readers who always start um, my uh, reading each book with the acknowledgement, um, if you can believe that. And um, I have to read specifically what you said in your acknowledgement. I instantly <laughs> warmed my heart when you said, um, it is a truth universally known that librarians are heroes these librarians aren't just heroes, they are superheroes. You are, uh, you're specifically thanking the librarians at the Smith College Special Coll um, Collections Library. Um, can you explain why you said that and how your intense research allowed this original concept to really bloom? Well, when I, when I first stumbled on Ruth Gaines's memoir, I was amazed to find that there was very little available about the Smith College Relief Unit. There had been no scholarly works written about them. There is actually one in the works right now. It's being written by a Smith professor, and I am so excited. I cannot wait for this book to come out, but unfortunately, it does not exist yet. Um, there are a few references to the Smith College Relief Unit in books about um, women who served overseas during World War I, and so on, but you know, all I could find about them was Ruth Gaines's memoirs and then these tantalizing snippets of letters that I think I mentioned before that had been published in the Smith College Alumni Quarterly in 1917 and 1918. There was also a pamphlet put together in the 1960s um, by a Smithy telling the story of the Smith College Relief Unit through excerpts from their letters and included some letters that were not in the Smith Alumni Quarterly, but was also, again, heavily edited. You could tell that you were missing bits. I had so many questions. There were so many gaps in the story. There were things that didn't quite make sense, like the fact that their director, I mean, this is her baby, she is passionate about the unit, suddenly ups and resigns um, a little over a week after they finally arrive at their headquarters in the Psalm. And I couldn't figure, there was nothing in the published letters that gave me any indication of why, and I smelled a rat. Um, but anyway, so I was desperate to find out more. And so I looked at Smith College Special Collections where they have a wonderful guide to their Smith College Relief Unit collections. I saw that they had letters and journals and so much from all of the original members of the unit. I thought, oh great, you know, maybe, maybe I'll find a few of these complete letters to read. And I composed a wish list of items I really wanted because unfortunately, well, unfortunately might be the wrong word, but at the time I had a one-year-old and a five-year-old and there was no way I was gonna be able to get away to Northampton and certainly not long enough to go through all this material. Um, 
so I sent an optimistic email. They said they had digitization services. I thought, well, maybe they wouldn't mind copying a few of these things for me just so I can get answers to some of these questions and see what some of these letters looked like before they were edited. And so I sent off a wish list and they were like, you realize, do you realize how much material this actually is? Because all you could find see was that there were folders with these letters. You didn't know how many things were in the folder. And it was thousands of pages. And I was like, well, would you mind digitizing it? And they said, well, you know, there is a, they, they were very apologetic. They said, there is a fee. I was like, I will pay you whatever you need, but oh my goodness, you'll really do this for me. And they did, they digitized all of it. And it was so much material. And not only did they digitize it, they wanted to give me a sense of what the letters looked like since I couldn't be there with these letters myself. And they took some pictures of sort of the letters in the, in the wild. So I could see you know, what the colors were like, what the pages looked like before they had digitized them, and, which was above and beyond and meant so much to me. But anyway, so I spent four months then you know, in the comfort of my local Starbucks with these piles of papers and piles of sticky notes, reading through the archives that, that they had brought to me when I couldn't go to the archives. And this book honestly would not have been there without the material that the librarians of Smith College Special Collection sent to me. Well, they certainly did sound like superheroes to me. And I'd like to think that any librarian would be excited to help you with this type of project on behalf of librarians everywhere. Well, that, sound, that certainly sounds like a, quite a project. Um, I want to pivot a little bit of uh, speaking of your writing process, um, about your writing process. Um, you've mentioned that um, I, I think most writers, or I, I think that uh, conventional adage of if you want to be a good writer, most writers have to write every day, but you've mentioned your writing process is coming in fits and starts, and, and that's how you tend to develop your characters. Can you tell us a little bit about your, your writing process? Oh, sure. I've always admired those authors who wake up at five and work for two hours in the morning before the kids wake up every day. And they, they have these organized, structured writing routines. Um, when I wrote my first published book, I was a grad student in the Harvard History Department. And so I wrote around other things, which meant that, you know, there were times when I would have a whole week to do nothing but write. And I would have to put the manuscript aside for three months while I was grading student papers or trying to actually work on my neglected dissertation. And so, and then I wrote my next couple of books. I got my, by a bizarre quirk of fate, I got my first book contract my first month at Harvard Law and wound up writing another book as a 2L and then a book as a 3L. And so I had to structure my writing time around my law school classwork and exams, which meant that I would write like crazy for three days and then be a law student for four days and so on. Um, and then I practiced at a law firm for a little while while signing more book contracts and writing more books. And so when I finally, um, made the move to writing full time, I thought, okay, now's my chance. I am going to be that writer who works at for set hours every day. I'm going to produce a very regular page count and I will never again find myself in a situation where I have to write 70,000 words in one weekend because deadline is approaching and I really need to get this book done. And I couldn't do it. I found that my brain just doesn't work that way. And whether it was, I don't know if it's nature or nurture, whether it was simply a matter of habit by that point, because I was working on my oh gosh, fifth or sixth book already when I started writing for full time, or whether it's just something to do with the way my mind operates. But I found that, you know, some there are days when I'll sit in front of the computer and the characters are out to lunch. They just will not cooperate. Usually when that happens, it's because there's something wrong with the book, um, that I'm trying to force my characters into a situation they don't want to be in, um, that my outline isn't meshing with the way the characters are developing, and I need to just let my subconscious work it all out. So I find I work best, even now, you know, in fits and starts, that I will have days where I need to go and sort of spend a lot of time on the phone with my college roommate and browse for cheap dresses on the sale rack at Bloomies. Back when we could still do those things. And then days, you know, where I'll lock myself up and I will write, you know, 20,000 words in one day. Um, Band of Sisters, I, I had, when we went to lockdown in New York, I was three months from deadline. I wrote the last thousand pages, uh, sorry, thousand pages, last hundred thousand words or so in those three weeks. And that's, unfortunately, that's just how my writing process seems to work. I'm a fits and starts writer. That's really interesting. It's great that you kind of give yourself some breathing room and let the, the characters sort of ruminate and, and, and germinate like that and, and, and not force yourself to, 
to write a set number of words. It's, um, it's, it sounds very creative. Um, speaking of creative, um, you have an entire series of historical romance novels as part of the Pink Carnation series. And you also, in the past, taught a class at Yale entitled Reading the Regency Romance. Um, if you were to teach that class today, uh, would you assign your students to watch the Netflix Bridgerton series? You know, I have you to have seen it. I have to confess, I have not seen it yet. I feel awful about it because I feel like I ought to have, but I have a um, preschooler and a first grader. And the first grader does not believe that sleep is something that happens to other people. She is functionally a college student. So I can only watch things that are okay for the first grader to watch with me. So we've watched a lot of All Creatures Great and Small, and she has seen more British people being murdered than any first grader should. You know, Midsummer Murders, Poirot, Marple. We watch all the British mystery shows um, because somehow that's more okay than, you know, characters having rampant rumpy pumpy on scene I guess on screen I guess but anyway so one of these days hopefully I will finally be able to get her to bed and watch Bridgerton um, I've got many reports on Bridgerton for other from other people and I am really delighted that it's bringing romance to a larger audience because back when I was writing my Napoleonic set romances you know part of my my mission was to um, I wanted people to know how clever romance could be, that it wasn't just, it wasn't your mother's bodice ripper. This was not all Kathleen E. Woodowis and heaving bosoms, that there were a lot that went into these stories. And like, as in any genre, there's the very good and the very mediocre, but the very good is very, very good indeed. And so I really hope that Bridgerton is introducing a whole new generation to romance and that we'll stop using the word romance as a slur when referring to books. Very interesting. Um, speaking of romance, going back to Band of Sisters, was the character of Will based on anyone in real life? I, I think everyone loves a good wartime <laughs> romance story. Um, I loved his character and I loved how he kind of came in literally on a horse at one point. Um, was he based on anyone in any of these uh, characters' lives or? Yes and no. So um, Captain Fitzwilliam DeWitt is the one love interest in the book. He was based partially on a random British major who keeps showing up in their letters. So everything, pretty much all of the things that Will does in the book are things this random British major did. Um, for, for example, you know, making sure they have duck walk. Duck walk was a kind of contraption you walked on in the mud of the Somme so you wouldn't sink knee deep into mud. And um, this British major visited the Smithies and saw that they were wrestling with the mud and they were using this very inferior duck walk the Germans had left them. And the next day, six Tommies showed up. Tommies were the rank and file of the British army and laid duck walk for the Smithies. So they went fall and hurt themselves. And in real life, this random British major who's always showing up did that. Um, and in my book, I have my fictional character, Captain Fitzwilliam DeWitt. And the literally riding in on the horse you talk about was again that random British major who when the Germans broke through the lines in March of 1918 rode in on horseback to tell the Smithies that they had to evacuate. Of course the Smithies completely ignored the order and instead of driving away from the German army drove towards the German army to go rescue their villagers. But you know the, the riding in on horseback to warn them it actually did happen. The only difference is as far as I can tell that random <laughs> this charming random British major did not have a love affair with any of the Smithies. On the other hand, there were many who did. Um, one of the women wrote home that there were there are a number of affairs in the unit at present. And the horrible thing is no one has any privacy for them because being the only English speaking, well, almost the only English speaking women in the Psalm, the Smithies were incredibly popular. They joked that their guest book was absolutely killing because every single British, Canadian and American army officer for miles around got the word that the Smithies were there and invented an excuse to drop by. And the Smithies wrote home in their letters about how hilarious they found some of these excuses and how lame these excuses were. And they finally had to tell their gentlemen callers to please confine your visits to Sundays because we have a lot of work to do and you're interfering with our work. We will have you to tea on Sunday. Do not show up until then. And if they did show up, they would you know, wind themselves, find themselves repairing a chicken coop or something like that because the Smithies would put them to work. But there was one marriage that came out of the unit's time in France with one of their many admirers. But again, it was not the random British major. So in this, as in other places, I sort of took things that happened 
to the real people and sort of assigned fictional faces to them. Yeah, that was always exciting when exciting would, uh, when he would come in and I love the dialogue it was very charming and, and there was so much subtext going on underneath um, the actual what they were saying to each other. So I thought that was really beautifully done. One question I wanted to ask, did the Smith uh, college, re uh, did the Smith unit, relief unit, uh, go back to Europe post-World War I? Well, they did. Um, it was heartbreaking for them because they were turfed out of their headquarters by the German invasion and all this work they had done. And they had just, in spring of 1918, they were really beginning to see results. You know, they had built community centers. They were sewing they had um, their villagers were sewing curtains for the community centers because they'd gone to the curtain sewing phase where you know they'd done enough of providing basic needs. And I mean, when we talk about basic needs, you know, when they got out there, children were sleeping on wooden planks in mud floors. They provided them beds, they provided them roofs, you know, that, that they had gone past these basic needs to the curtain hanging phase was absolutely incredible. They'd begun to plow the fields and plant seeds for the new crops to grow in this ravaged area. And they were really seeing their plans coming to fruition. The children were healthier, you know, people were farming and then the Germans invaded again. And they evacuated all their villagers, but they were heartbroken that all of these people were being evicted from their homes again goodness being sent to goodness only knew where, and the Smithies themselves were going to goodness only knew where. They had no idea where they were going to wind up. And so they wind up, at first they're evacuated, well, they're evacuated in several stages, but they wind up evacuated to Beauvais, where they wind up really doing the sort of war work they hadn't initially intended to do. They bring papers and treats to the wounded soldiers who come in. Um, they set up pop-up canteens at train stations for the wounded soldiers who are coming through, and they set up a social club for recuperating soldiers to come visit where they have sing-alongs and stuff like that. But it's not the work they were doing. They see a lot of really gravely wounded men. It's heartbreaking. And instead of sort of working for the future, they're there trying to mitigate the pain, if that makes any sense. But a lot of them feel very strongly that they want to go back whenever they can and pick up the work they've abandoned. They, they promised their villagers that they were going to rebuild their homes for them and that they would go back. And for a while, this seems almost impossible to them. The Germans keep coming and coming and the situation gets worse and worse and they get farmed out to other organizations. But in January, 1919, they finally are allowed to go back. And a, f a handful of the members of the original group, there are some new recruits and a handful of the old members who call themselves the old contemptibles, go back to Grey Corps and they rebuild. And they really, they, they actually rebuild. I mean, the weirdest bit for them is when they go back to rebuild in 1919 without the German shelling breathing down their necks, without the war going on right near them, they're assigned a bunch of German um, prisoners of war to help them rebuild. And they're kind of freaked out by this because these are the people who did such hideous things who, I mean, to them, they're the big bad wolf teeth and all. And one of them writes home how really weird it is that these, these, they just, they don't have horns. They seem like normal boys and they're actually really helpful with the rebuilding work. And it's just, it's such shock to them that these Germans who were so horrific are there, you know, helping them rebuild their villages. Anyway, so they do get to go back. They do rebuild. And the very last smithy leaves France in 1922 when they hand over the final bits of the work to the French government. So it's a remarkable accomplishment on their part and they really see it through. That's fascinating. That's really fascinating. Um, do you envision uh, the Band of Sisters as being a standalone or perhaps part of a series? Well, this book was definitely a standalone, although while I was writing it, I became really fascinated by the founder of the unit. Um, the real woman was named Harriet Boyd Hawes. My fictionalized version of her was, uh, I named her Betsy Hayes Rutherford. But anyway, um, the founder of the unit, she began dropping little hints to me about her past as I was writing this because she had a fascinating past. This was the woman who I mentioned before who graduated from Smith and went to the classical, the School of Classical Studies in Athens to um, become an archeologist and was told she couldn't excavate and said, well, no, I'm not going to be a classics librarian. I am here to dig and dig I will. She also scandalized Athens by biking around the city in bloomers, you know, as one does. But while she was there, the Greco-Turkish war broke out. 
And despite failing her Red Cross exam, she pulled strings. She had high friends in the in Greek aristocratic circles. She pulled strings and got herself sent to the front where despite failing her Red Cross exam, she did amazing things and was decorated by Queen Olga of Greece. But here's where there was a weird little gap in her story that caught my attention because a year later, she goes back to Greece and you know digs up Crete and this groundbreaking archeological work that people are still talking about today. But before she went to go dig up Crete, she came back to the States and wound up joining Clara Barden and the Red Cross to nurse in the Spanish-American War. I thought, wait, that's so weird. Why does she come back? Why does she go nurse in the Spanish-American War? Why drop everything and do that? It just, it didn't make sense to me. Um, I'm not going to opine about why the real woman did that, but my fictional character started throwing out little hints to me. So that's the book I'm writing right now. It's about this Smith grad who wants to be an archeologist and finds her life upended by what she sees in the Greco-Turkish war and then has to redeem herself and find you know, the person she can really be by going to Cuba and nursing during the Spanish American war. So it's a coming of age story. It's also, um, I found the most amazing material about nurses in the Spanish American war. These heroic women who were written out of that story. You can't find any references to them in any of the official books on the Spanish American War, but if you go digging, what they did over there was truly incredible. So I'm really looking forward to resurrecting their forgotten history in this book. Well, thank you for, for giving us, uh, that was going to be my next uh, question of what your next project would be. And it sounds like you've got quite uh, quite a bit of info next on your next project. You have a little bit more than an outline, I would say, and that sounds equally exciting. Um, one thing about going back to Band of Sisters, if there's one lesson, one thing you wanna talk about, what do you want readers to take away after reading this book? That everyone can be a helper, that you don't. So the thing that really inspired me about the Smith women is most of the time they didn't know what they were doing, but they were thrown into these situations and they muddled along that you know, they had to go buy chickens for the villagers, but their agriculturalist was stranded in DC and didn't get there late. So they had to do it themselves. And they accidentally bought roosters and then couldn't figure out why none of them were laying eggs. And they were really, they were embarrassed, but you know, they sold the roosters and they tried again. And so there were all of these things they had to learn how to do from fixing broken trucks on the fly in the mud um, to, figuring out how to set up a pop-up canteen during a German invasion. And they just, they, they wound up having to abandon all their plans again and again, and just turn their hand to whatever needed doing. And I think that's a great lesson to all of us, especially during the early stages of the pandemic when everything felt really daunting to know that you know everyone could help, that you didn't necessarily have to be, um, trained or you know, everyone could do their bit in their own way. And I really think that's the message of Band of Sisters. That's an amazing, that's, that's an amazing uh, view. And this is an amazing book. Thank you so much, Lauren, for visiting us and telling us more about the Band of Sisters, which um, is hot off the presses. It's just been published in early March. Um, again, Lauren was kind enough to sign a limited number of copies, uh, autographed copies of her book. They are available at Diane's Books of Greenwich, an independent uh, bookstore here in Greenwich. It's, uh, it's a, a town gem. Uh, you can contact them at their number, which is 203-869-1515, or you can email them at info at dianesbooks.com, and you can also visit them on their website. Um, we also want to thank uh, the board of uh, the, li the Greenwich Library Board of Trustees and contributions of our gen uh, from our general do donors. Thank you so much for uh, spending uh, a few moments with a wonderful, wonderful author, Lauren Willig. Lauren, would you finish? Uh, would you finish? Uh, would you visit us when we are able to open to the public? I hope you can visit us in person very soon because we want to have you not on our virtual stage but on our actual stage soon. So I hope you can visit us soon. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you to Lauren. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a delight talking to you today. You as well, and go out and read this book because you will enjoy it.